My name is Dr. Catherine Bettis. Welcome everyone to the bio seminar, research seminar series. Our speaker today is Dr. Chris Vitek. He's an associate professor in biology at UTRGV. He teaches things like medical entomology and disease epidemiology, as well as the graduate courses like biometrics. Um, Dr. Vitek did his bachelor's in biology with a minor in math at Drew University in New Jersey, and then a PhD in biology at Clark University in Massachusetts. Um, his research interests are in the biology and ecology of mosquitoes and other vectors of disease. So for example, a recent publication of his was about the vectors of dengue, um, human activity and virus transmission potential in the Rio Grande Valley. He also studies um, Zika transmission, pretty much any mosquito particularly, but vector-borne disease transmission here locally. And he's the director of our um, Center for Ve Study of Vector-Borne Diseases. So I'd like to go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Vitek. Thank you very much, Dr. Perez. Um, I will say that this is my first time giving a seminar while I'm sitting at my desk. So please bear with me if it looks like I don't know where I'm looking or if there's a little confusion at times, but hopefully this is a learning process for everybody. And so we'll uh, be, all be able to uh, move forward and have a good time while learning a little bit about the wonderful world of mosquitoes. So today what I'm gonna talk a little bit about are uh, some of the work that we're doing that's being funded by the Centers for Disease Control and the Texas Department of State Health Services. Uh, specifically some surveillance activity work that we're involved in in the lower Rio Grande Valley region of Texas. Um, I realize that not everyone has the same uh, background or is coming to the coming to the table with the same uh, information. So I'm going to actually start off by giving a little bit of a brief overview about mosquitoes, about uh, what, how we recognize mosquitoes, about what uh, how they transmit diseases and so forth before I start talking about the surveillance efforts. Um, I want to start off with a slide of acknowledgments. A lot of times you'll see these slides at the very end of the talk, and it sort of gives a short, uh, short shrift to all the people that are involved in these efforts. So I want to make sure that I recognize them and give them their due before uh, just sort of uh, one-offing the slide. So there's a lot of people in my lab uh, that are involved under the UTRGV banner. We work with a lot of cities and counties in the region the County of Hidalgo, Harlan, City of Harlingen, City of McAllen, City of Brownsville, a number of other cities in the region that have been very benefit, helpful. Um, a lot of the, the funding does come through the Centers for Disease Control through a grant we have with U, through UTMB with the Western Gulf Center of Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. So I'd like to thank UTMB for their uh, efforts and their assistance. Uh, we do work with people at the CDC. Um, one of the people I've been working with frequently is Dr. John Paul Mutebi. Um, he's an entomologist at the CDC, uh, does a lot of work uh, in this region, actually comes and travels down here to visit this region. He loves having tacos down here, uh, probably about once every few months or so, although not over the past couple months. And then, as I said, we also work with the Texas Department of State Health Services, their arboviral testing labs, as well as uh, the Region 11 Director, Dr. Ron Tyler, who's a doctor of veterinary medicine. So there's a lot of people that are involved in these efforts. So thank you to all of them. One thing I wanted to get started with is I start, I added this slide a few, uh, about a week ago uh, to sort of differentiate between the idea of vector-borne versus non-vector-borne diseases. I'm sure we've all heard in the news about COVID-19 right now. Um, and so that may be sort of in the forefront of people's mind, but there are some very clear differences and strong differences between vector-borne diseases and non-vector-borne. With vector-borne diseases, they have to be transmitted by an intermediary. In many cases, this is uh, some sort of arthropod, oftentimes a tick or a mosquito, a flea, something along those lines that uh, carry the disease from one infected host to another one. And so with non-vector-borne diseases, you can usually have some sort of direct transmission from one infected host to another, or you can have something where that uses uh, what are called fomites or waterborne transmission. Uh, fomites are surfaces or any inanimate materials. So uh, someone coughs on a surface, a desk, and then someone else uh, wipes their hands on the desk and they pick up a pathogen. So that was, would not be a vector-borne disease um, because it doesn't have this living uh, intermediary that can transmit it. 
So COVID-19 obviously is a, a non-vector-borne disease, or I'm, uh, a non-vector-borne disease, but my talk and my research focuses on vector-borne diseases. One thing that's interesting about vector-borne diseases is that in many cases, they can actually end up being much more virulent and deadly than non-vector-borne diseases. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, a non-vector-borne disease wants to keep its host alive. If, it's, if the host is dead, it's not going to be able to be transmitted anymore. And so you oftentimes see an evolutionary change in virulence where diseases become less severe over time. But with a vector-borne disease, because you have that intermediary animal, a tick or a mosquito, the host itself can become very sick, can become uh, immobile, that you don't have to rely on host-to-host -host contact for transmission. And the last key thing is that not all diseases can be vector-borne. We have, we have a lot of uh, questions right now. I hear a lot of like, well, can mosquitoes transmit COVID-19? Can ticks transmit them? No, they can't. Uh, there have to be some very specific biological conditions for diseases to be able to be transmitted through vector transmission. Um, there are uh, very few diseases that can be transmitted directly or through vectors. Uh, one example of those is plague. Most diseases are either vector-borne or uh, direct transmission from host to, <clears throat> excuse me, host to host. So when we talk about vector-borne diseases, uh, we oftentimes classify those diseases into two types. We maybe refer to something as enzootic transmission. And in this case, we oftentimes have a non-human animal that serves as the primary host of the disease. And so what oftentimes will happen is you have enzootic transmission of the disease where the enzootic host, the animal, becomes infected. It gets picked, bitten by a mosquito or a tick who then transmits it to a new enzootic host. The way that people become infected in those circumstances oftentimes is what's, what, what's referred to as spillover into the human population. We aren't involved in the primary transmission cycle. We aren't uh, essential for transmission of the disease, but there are simply enough infected vectors out there that we have cases where people get bitten by the mosquito or the tick or the flea, and that spillover effect then in, uh, runs and in, comes into play and people end, end up getting sick. And so some examples of Enzootic transmission diseases are West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, and of course I just noticed a spelling mistake on my slide there. Uh, that always happens when you're in the middle of giving a talk. The other kind is non-enzootic transmission. This is where we have vector-borne disease, but humans act as the host. So we have humans getting sick, they get bitten by the vector, such as a mosquito, and then it gets transmitted to another human. So in these cases, we don't have this enzootic host, we don't have this animal that becomes sick and said humans are the primary reservoir. The disease circulates in us and then remains transmitted in the human population through this vector contact. And some examples of those are chikungunya virus, Zika virus, dengue virus, urban yellow fever virus. So the reason why studying vectors is so important is because vectors play this uh, essential role in vector-borne diseases. Um, they have to Ultimately, a disease has to infect the vector in order to continue the transmission cycle. The vector does marry not a matter. Not all diseases can infect every single vector. So we need to know about the kind of vectors, what they're susceptible to, how readily they can become infected when biting a host. They then undergo what's referred to as an extrinsic incubation period. And I have an animation I'll be showing you in a second. Um, so what that means is the mosquito becomes infected through the usually the ingestion of a blood meal. Uh, mosquitoes bite, ticks bite, fleas bite, but it doesn't mean they're able to transmit the disease right away. They have to go undergo this EIP before they can transmit the disease. And so there are a lot of different factors that influence whether or not a vector is going to be able to transmit a disease. Um, how long this EIP is, if, it, if it's longer than the vector lives, that means the vector is not going to be able to transmit the disease. But in addition to that, through the infection process, there are various barriers that the disease has to go through. So here I have this sort of cross section of a mosquito here. Um, and I want to go through the step-by-step -step process of what happens as vectors become infected. So the first thing is you have a mosquito who is taking a blood meal or any vector that's taking a blood meal picks up the virus or the pathogen in that process, and then the pathogen populates inside the midgut of the uh, vector itself. At this point, that vector is still not able to transmit the disease. The mosquito is not able to transmit the disease, even though it would come back as an infected mosquito. 
What has to happen is that virus eventually has to pass through what's the first of two barriers that's referred to as the mid-gut barrier. If it can't pass through that mid-gut lining, that mosquito is never going to be able to transmit a disease. If it can, and there are multiple ways that it can pass through, then the, the, what the process is referred to as dissemination, and the pathogen, the virus represented by those red dots, spreads through the entire mosquito's body. Um, it will still come back as infected. Um, you can actually test this by testing different parts of the body. If you have an infected mosquito, but for example, the legs don't come back as positive for the virus, you know that that dissemination has not taken place. The next thing that has to happen is the virus has to pass through a secondary barrier that's in the salivary glands. If it can't pass through that barrier, again, the mosquito is not going to be able to transmit the disease. But if it can pass through the, the vet, that barrier, then the, mosquito, the virus enters the salivary glands of the mosquito. And at this point, and only this point, is this mosquito now able to transmit the disease. Because the next time it feeds on a host, it injects a little bit of the saliva that includes an immunosuppressant, includes an anticoagulant, help mix easier for the mosquito to feed. And in the process of doing that, then also injects that host with the virus itself. So that entire process, that, uh, go, going through those two barriers, is referred to this as the extrinsic incubation period. So if we look at the transmission cycle of a disease, here we have a situation where this might be the uh, enzootic transmission cycle. This might be something like St. Louis encephalitis or West Nile virus, where we normally see transmission and, uh, between the animal host, which is a bird, and the vectors, which are mosquitoes. And here's that extrinsic incubation period, and you can see it might last anywhere from about one to three weeks, depending on the disease, depending on environmental conditions. In the way when we have this kind of cycle that a uh, human becomes sick is we have this spillover effect that I talked about where we simply have so many infected vectors out there that some of them are going to bite be people or in case of something like West Nile virus, other uh, secondary hosts like horses who might then pick up a disease. In most, in many cases, those secondary hosts, humans or people, are, are never going to develop enough of viremia to enter into a continuous transmission cycle. You'll see these are dotted lines, so this cycle doesn't always repeat itself, and we sort of end up with humans or these other secondary hosts as dead-end hosts because the virus transmission stops there. So I want to talk a little bit now about the mosquitoes themselves. So mosquitoes are uh, ubiquitous, they're found pretty much on every continent except Antarctica. Uh, basically, if there are people living there, then there are going to be there are going to be mosquitoes there. Mosquitoes are the most important arthropod for uh, that affect human and animal health on a worldwide basis. Now, here in the U.S., you could make a strong argument that ticks are more important because we have more cases of Lyme disease uh, in the U.S. than other uh, vector-borne diseases. But on a worldwide basis, uh, it's really mosquitoes that transmit most diseases that have the greatest impact in terms of the millions and millions of people that might become affected by these diseases. If you want to think about sort of the uh, historical effect of vector-borne diseases, if you think about all the people that have ever died on this planet from the uh, from the very first human historic uh, by evolutionary historically that was alive to now, it's estimated that anywhere from one third to one half of those died due to malaria. So one single mosquito-borne disease could be literally considered responsible for half of the human deaths ever in the history of humanity. Now, mosquitoes, there's a lot of different types. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. They live in a lot of different areas. There are even some mosquitoes that we refer to have become domesticated in that they've adapted and evolved to live in close proximity to people. They feed on people. They live in people's dwellings. They breed in habitats that people have available to them. And so uh, that's, their, that's their preferential location. And again, there's a lot of money that's spent on uh, vector-borne disease not even just for diseases themselves, but for nuisance uh, concerns as well. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent trying to control the mosquito populations. Um, hundred, millions and, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent on trying to understand what's going on with these diseases. It's one thing I always tell students in the medical entomology class, there's a lot of money in this field for people that want to go into it. So a little bit more about mosquitoes. Uh, they are animals. They are in the order Diptera, uh, family Culicidae. They're about uh, 3,500 different species of mosquitoes worldwide. 
a huge number that are found around the world. And again, not all of these can transmit diseases. Not all of these are even going to bite people all the time. Here in the U.S., we have about 172 species. In Texas alone, there are about 85 species. That's more than any other state in the U.S. So uh, as normal with Texas, go big or go home. And then in, uh, here in South Texas, specifically in Cameron and Hidalgo counties, we probably have about 55 different species of mosquitoes. This list that I have here shows some specific uh, species that we've that I've personally collected or my lab has collected with different kinds of trapping methods. So there's not all 55 here. I think there's probably about 40, uh, 35 or 40 different mosquito species here. Uh, some of these, in some cases, we've only found one or two specimens. In other cases, we've found hundreds, if not thousands of specimens. So there's different uh, uh, commonalities of these mosquitoes. But certainly, uh, there's a lot of different types here. And again, not every single one of these is a concern, either as a nuisance because it bites people or as a disease threat because it's able to transmit diseases. Now, some of these things you may have seen before and thought mosquitoes, these are not mosquitoes. Uh, fly midges, uh, crane flies, midges, fungal gnats, these are things that are commonly mistaken for mosquitoes because they superficially look the same. They have two wings, they have these long legs. Um, they have the antenna that looks similar, but the easiest way that you can identify a mosquito, especially a female mosquito, is looking at the mouth parts. If you look at these uh, uh, dipterans, they don't have that proboscis, that biting implement that the female mosquitoes have that's recognizable. So mosquitoes are also interesting biologically just because of their life cycle. They're what, as what we refer to as a holometabolic insect, meaning they have a dual life cycle stage with a pupil stage in between. Uh, this, this means that they're considered a, a relatively evolutionary advanced uh, arthropod. They're also interesting because they're one of the few animals out there that has dual aquatic and terrestrial life cycle stages. Usually you have a situation where animals either live on the land and they stay on the land or they live in the water and stay in the water. Rarely do you have a situation where you have uh, animals that spend part of their life cycle in the land, part of their life cycle in the water. This makes them biologically interesting. It makes them easy to study because if you have mosquito larvae, you can do uh, manipulate them very easily for experiments. From control purposes, if you're talking about controlling the populations, it means that you can engage in trying to control the aquatic stages of the eggs or larvae or pupa, or you could try and control the adult stage, which is the terrestrial stage. So what good are mosquitoes? Uh, this is something that I get asked a lot. Why do we have them? What good are they? What role do they serve? Well, the short answer is they don't really serve any significant role that we know of. Uh, no good. They transmit diseases. They bother people. However, if you start delving down a little bit, they can do some things that are beneficial. They do uh, help pollinate. They do feed on nectar, especially the males only feed on nectar. They don't bite. And so they are uh, helpful in pollinating. Uh, they also are a food source for other organisms, including a lot of other arthropods, things like spiders, a lot of birds, uh, fish, mammals feed on uh, mosquitoes, either in the aquatic stage or the uh, terrestrial stage. However, when you look at that to date, there's no information that they play a keystone role in, in any sort of ecological cycle. If you think back to ecology, a keystone species is one such that if the uh, if it changed, if it was removed from the uh, eco web where you see the, all the interactions, that would drastically change the interactions. And so it's unlikely that, or at least at this point, that we don't know of any keystone role that mosquitoes play in the populations. Now, we do have a lot of vector-borne diseases that are concerns down here in South Texas. Um, not all of these are mosquito-borne. We have some tick-borne diseases. We have some flea-borne diseases. Uh, this area of Texas is actually one of the primary areas where we see murine typhus or flea-borne typhus. Uh, we have Chagas disease, which is transmitted by a true bug, a reduvia, excuse me, a reduvid. But of course, in my lab, we really focus on a lot of the mosquito-borne diseases and the mosquito biology. So, and recently we've added Zika to that list of, of concerns uh, over the past few years. And if you look at sort of what's been going on in South Texas over the past few years, uh, we do see cases of dengue in South Texas. We do have, uh, we have had a local transmission of chikungunya. We have West Nile virus, Brownsville, when Zika was announced, Brownsville became, was identified by the CDC as a high risk zone for Zika transmission. So all of these are real concerns that we have to the population that live in this region. 
If we look from a historical perspective of disease cases, um, you see I break these diseases down into local or non-local transmission. When we talk about local transmission, again, this is something that you're hearing with COVID-19. That refers to someone who's gotten sick where we can't identify they've traveled to a location where they were likely picked up the disease. They may have traveled, but it wasn't an area where they got sick or where they picked up the disease. So when we talk about dengue local transmission, it's people who were sick with dengue, but likely picked it up here versus people who might have gotten dengue elsewhere and then traveled back here where it was identified. Those are referred to as travel cases. So you can see with dengue, we do have travel cases as well as local transmission. The last major outbreak of dengue virus was in 2013, where we had, I think, around 25 local transmitted cases. As I mentioned, we, did, we have had one local transmitted case of chikungunya in 2016. Zika is when 2006, or 2016 is when Zika really hit as well. And we had local transmission in both Cameron and Hidalgo County in 2016 and 17. West Nile virus, we do have cases of that every year. Uh, the story of West Nile virus is actually pretty interesting in and of itself. Uh, the last major outbreak of West Nile virus was around 2012 or so. One of the tools that we have to try and identify or uh, determine what's going on with these diseases is a process that's called surveillance. And this is what some of the funding that we have that is doing. So surveillance is critical for predicting outbreaks, uh, trying to identify if there's a risk of an outbreak, uh, trying to identify if there's an ongoing outbreak. Uh, we're currently working with a lot of different partners uh, to engage in the surveillance activities. And a lot of the surveillance is focused on those vectors, collecting the vectors, identifying vectors, testing vectors, and so forth. So surveillance activity, this is a really good definition. Um, I, I actually always tell people don't read from slides directly, but I'm going to violate that by reading this because I really want to make sure that this definition is understood. So surveillance can be defined as an ongoing systematic collection and analysis of data and information, including the dissemination of that information to those who need to know in order that action may be taken. So there are a few key things in this definition, ongoing and systematic collection and analysis of data. What this means is that surveillance activities have to be going on in a consistent basis, on a regular basis. It can't be just sort of this a periodic, hey, I feel like going and collecting some information right now. That kind of information could still be useful, but it's not really a surveillance activity because you have nothing to compare it to as you want to look to see how, it's how things are changing over time. And then the second component is including the dissemination of this information. That's a key part of public health. You may be collecting information, but the key thing is you're also giving that information to someone who can do something about it. In our case, any of the data we collect is provided to the local counties or cities. It's local, provided to the CDC. It's provided to the Texas Department of State Health Services. So hopefully if they need to, they can use that to help make decisions regarding control efforts, regarding uh, human surveillance, regarding concerns about outbreaks. I don't have the ability myself to suddenly announce, oh, there's a potential outbreak happening. That's not my role. That's not my responsibility. Um, I don't have the training to do that. So I provide the information I collect to someone who potentially can use it in that fashion. I'm going to quickly go over some of the ways that we collect some of this data, this ongoing systematic collection. Uh, we usually involve a lot of different kinds of trapping methods. So we can use what are referred to as oviposition traps to collect mosquito eggs. Uh, this is someone doing what's referred to as larval dipping. Uh, they have nice telescoping handles right now. So us old people don't have to bend over her or backs to trying to pick up aquatic larvae in these areas where they breed. We also have adult tip trapping where you can uh, collect different kinds of adults. So for example, you might use what are called light or CO2 baited traps to attract adults. Uh, you can use gravid traps to attract adults that are looking for somewhere to lay eggs. So this would specifically attract females. You can use these backpack aspirators, and it really is just basically like a backpack vacuum. I'm sorry, vacuum. Uh, and you go around and you can aspirate areas where you think mosquitoes are going to be found, culverts, covered areas, wooded areas. Sometimes you can even set up traps like these. These are just little boxes that are called resting boxes that mosquitoes will congregate in. They don't like the heat. They don't like the dry temperature. So if they're somewhere that's a little cooler, a little protected, that's where gonna, they're going to be found most of the day. You can also do things that like, such as uh, landing rates. Uh, this is actually a picture of a professor from my postdoc, uh, Dr. Phil Lunibus uh, in the swamps of Florida. He had just, uh, he had just taken off, he sent me this picture, he had just taken off in a canoe and within seconds- Here's he had what I found. 
up Siri on my watch is talking to me, I apologize. Um, he had just taken off in his canoe and within seconds he was swarming by with mosquitoes. Uh, you can go out in the field and do these landing rate counts where you sort of go out there in the designated areas for a certain period of time and remove mosquitoes for your, from yourself. But there are different kinds of biases that are associated with these traps. Those CO2 traps, uh, light traps, there's a BG sentinel trap that uh, I didn't mention, landing rate counts, those are all going to be uh, collecting female mosquitoes primarily that are looking for hosts, looking for a blood meal. Uh, Oviposition traps, uh, those examples here, these are going to be females that are looking for somewhere to lay eggs. So these are females now that have already taken a blood meal, have undergone oogenesis and are ready to oviposit. And then respirator traps, if you use those backpack aspirators uh, to collect resting trap adult, rest, resting collections, those are ones that are going to collect a good diversity of the kinds of mosquitoes, a mixture of males and females, uh, ones that have fed, ones that have not fed, ones that are newly emerged, ones that are host seeking, and so forth. So depending on what your goals are, you might use different kinds of traps to try and collect different kinds of uh, populations here. So for that bit quick background, I want to quickly go through some of the surveillance efforts that we're involved in. Um, there are two primary efforts. One of these is funded by the CDC through the Western Gulf Center of Excellence in Vector-Borne Diseases. And this is a disease surveillance effort where we are involved in identifying and testing mosquitoes that are collected and testing them for diseases. And then the Texas Department of State Health Services is a funding a secondary effort where we're looking at insecticide resistance. Since insecticides are the primary way that we use, uh, that we control mosquito populations, it's absolutely critical to be able to see if they're uh, evolving resistance the same way we talk about antibiotic resistance. Um, so because if they're evolving that resistance, then all of a sudden the insecticides aren't going to be as effective anymore. So first I'm going to talk about the disease surveillance. This is something that we're working with very closely with some of the different cities and counties. Uh, Hidalgo County, the city of Brownsville are involved. We don't have the personnel to do the regular collections, but they do. So they go out and they set these traps, they collect the mosquitoes, and then they bring them to us for uh, testing and identification and processing. So Hidalgo County, we, I, we offer our advice and guidance to what we do, but we don't, I want, don't want to specifically try and tell them this is how you have to do it because we're really uh, dependent on their cooperation. So Hidalgo County has decided they're going to use a variety of different kinds of traps including BG sentinel traps and light traps. If you recall, those are the ones that are going to collect the host-seeking females. Uh, gravid traps are going to be the ones that collect the females that are ready to lay eggs. And then back, backpack aspirators that are going to collect those resting collections. The city of Brownsville uh, uses exclusively BG sentinel traps that are uh, primarily designed to collect these uh, host-seeking populations. So here we have a quick map of the locations. This is Hidalgo County. This is the entire county right here. Hidalgo County uh, conducts trapping in a variety of areas. Uh, in many cases, what they'll do is they'll trap in one location for a few weeks, then trap in a different location to sort of try and get an overall view of what might be happening in the entire county. So these dots represent all the different locations where they've collected samples to bring to us. Um, what that means is we get a good geographic representation, but maybe we lose a little bit out on the temporal scale because we don't collect in every single location on a weekly or monthly basis. The city of Brownsville is obviously much more focused just in the city region. They have about 40 different traps they set up on a weekly basis. 20 of these are sent to the state labs for testing and 20 of these uh, represented by these dots here are sent to us for our testing. So a quick overview of some of the data that we've collected. We started this effort in 2017. Um, as you can see, we only had Hidalgo County involved in 2017. And I will quickly mention Hidalgo County, we're also working with the city of McAllen in this effort. So uh, we have both of them doing trapping for us. So 2017, we were just setting up, we were figuring out what we were doing, we were training people. And so we only collected about 614 mosquitoes, not very many when we're talking about collecting mosquitoes. You really want to be in the thousands in order to be able to start drawing any conclusions. 2018 in Hidalgo County, you can see that number jumped drastically to 31,000 uh, mosquitoes. I will say that, it, however, the majority of those, over about 22,000 of them, were from the same single night, four different locations, and consisted of two different species of mosquitoes. 
And so basically our traps were set up in the right place or depending on your point of view in the wrong place at the right time or wrong time. And so we caught these huge, huge numbers of mosquitoes. Um, it was likely that there was an emergence. Some uh, eggs had just recently hatched. Those, the pupae were, uh, uh, the adults were emerging from pupae or something along those lines. And then in 2019, the numbers dropped down a little bit, uh, down to about 7,000 mosquitoes or so. Brownsville started participating in 2018, uh, about three months, uh, uh, so October, November, and December. Uh, you see that they sent us about 11,000 mosquitoes over that three month period. And then in 2019, they sent us almost 30,000 mosquitoes. So again, they're using that one BG Sentinel trap. In many cases, BG Sentinel traps only collect maybe half a dozen to a dozen mosquitoes on the other, but with the Brownsville, they're collecting in some cases hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes in these BG Sentinel traps. So there's simply a lot of mosquitoes out there. The numbers of species you can see we're usually getting somewhere in the 20s. Uh, 25, 24, 22 uh, different species uh, that have been collected over the course of the year. Um, we've, these are the three primary species that we're interested in. Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus are the ones that can potentially transmit dengue virus as well as chikungunya virus and Zika virus. Uh, Culex quincafasciatus is the primary vector of concern for West Nile virus. So those are the three mosquitoes that we're really interested in for this effort because of these 20 to 25 other species, the others are either not vectors or they're such unlikely vectors we don't really focus on them. So you can see we are getting a large number of those three mosquitoes, mostly Aegypti and Culex quincafasciatus mosquitoes. We do get a few of those Aedes albopictus in there as well. This is a map of the female collections from uh, Hidalgo County. Uh, you can see, uh, if you sort of squint your eyes a little bit, you see this bimodal peak here where we see a peak of number of females in the er late, uh, early spring, late spring, early summertime period. It then drops down because to be honest, it just gets too hot and too dry for mosquitoes, just like we don't like the heat as well, they don't like it. But then once we hit the fall season where it starts to cool off, we get a little bit more rain, we see a big jump in that mosquito population again. And so this is sort of the combined data from 2018, 2019. You may notice it only goes up to 1500 because I've removed an instance where we had a single trap where we had more than a thousand species or a thousand individuals of the same species because that was probably a single emergence and not a typical pattern that we would see. But you can see that pattern here. If you compare that to sort of the pattern from 2019 in Brownsville, we don't see that same bimodal peak. It seems a little bit more scattered. We do we see a variety of peaks of abundance. Uh, this is likely because Brownsville is generally going to be a little bit cooler uh, than uh, the Hidalgo County area. It's generally a little bit more humid, and so we're more likely to see mosquito activity year-round those slight temperature and humidity fluctuations can play a big role. Now, this is only from one year. Uh, we're very interested to see if, well, I will say we were very interested to see if 2020 uh, had showed any difference in patterns. Um, and so uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue the trapping effort and the collection efforts uh, through this COVID-19 uh, pandemic right now. Now, I mentioned we collect a lot of different species. In Hidalgo County, we've collected a total of 27 different species. Uh, as you recall, I mentioned that the majority of those from those, those 22,000 species or 22,000 individuals were Sorophora, Columbiae, and Ocularitata sphalcter. So that makes up the bulk of this pie chart here. If we get rid of those, that gives us a more representative view of the species diversity that we find. So we see that we have about 25% of the mosquitoes collected are Aedes aegypti. About 25% of the mosquitoes collected are Culex quincafasciatus. We then collect a lot of Sorophora cyanescens. This is a nuisance mosquito, not a primary vector concern. We collect a, anywhere from about 10, maybe to 15% of a variety of other species. Again, a lot of nuisance species. And then Aedes albopictus is this orange bar here. We have about 10 to 15% Aedes albopictus as another vector of concern. Compare that to Brownsville and you see a drastic difference in the species composition. In Brownsville from the traps, we see that we get almost 50% of the mosquitoes collected Culex quincafasciatus. These are those West Nile vectors. We, get, we still get around 
or so of Aedes aegypti, the vectors for dengue, Zika, and chikungunya virus. But then we have a very small wedge, very low number of uh, Aedes albopictus. And I want you to remember this because I'm going to be coming back to this in a moment. So once we collect these mosquitoes, we go through and we identify these. So we have uh, employees and students that are working to identify mosquitoes, thousands and thousands of mosquitoes down to the species that are brought in. I mentioned the three that, that we focus on. We also do test Culex niger palpus and Culex tarsalis. We do two different kinds of tests. Uh, we have a triplex assay to test for Zika virus, dengue virus, and chikungunya virus in the 280s species. And we also then test the West Nile, uh, the Culex species for West Nile virus, because this is what they're able to transmit. We're currently working on developing a triplex for that as well. That would also include Western equine encephalitis and St. Louis encephalitis, other diseases that can be transmitted by Culex mosquitoes. We use a quantitative real-time PCR analysis. Um, if we find positives, uh, then, we will use, then we use cell culture to confirm that there is living virus as opposed to just a piece of viral RNA that's in the mosquito specimen. We also can send positive samples to the state for additional confirmation. Uh, we have, however, partnered recently and become certified by the state uh, Department of State Health Services for collections and diagnostic, diagnostics uh, as a regional testing facility. So this makes it actually easier to work with local city and county partners because basically the state has given us the stamp of approval for our testing efforts. So here we have some results from the testing itself. So remember, we collect all these mosquitoes, thousands and thousands of mosquitoes, and test them all. And if you look quickly at these results, you'll see that we have yet to find a positive mosquito. This is good news. This is something that we're happy to see for the most part, because if we have positive mosquitoes, that means that there's an increased risk of disease transmission and potential for an outbreak. On the other hand, some, uh, some of these were still pending. We're still waiting for finalization of tests. Some of these efforts in testing have been disrupted a little bit because of the COVID-19 situation. And so hopefully we'll get those tested soon. But you can see for Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, we started off just testing for Zika virus and eventually moved to that triplex. Culex quinca fasciatus, we started, we're testing for West Nile virus. Again, thousands and thousands of mosquitoes, 15,000 Culex quinca fasciatus from Brownsville have already been tested, still waiting for about 3,000 more. 5,000 Aedes aegypti were tested for, uh, or I'm sorry, almost 8,000 Aedes aegypti were tested for the Zika dengue chikungunya. Uh, in Hidalgo County, we had about uh, almost 2,000 Culex quinca fasciatus, and again, close to 4,000 Aedes aegypti. So we're talking about testing these huge numbers. So the fact that we're getting negatives is a good sign. If we were only testing a few mosquitoes and got negatives, it wouldn't really be that useful information. But by testing with these huge numbers, it tells us that there is not a lot of this virus, if any, circulating in the mosquito populations. From there, I want to move and talk a little bit about the second study that we're engaged in, and this is the insecticide resistance surveillance effort that is, uh, I don't know what that type of equation here is. Uh, this is the one that's funded by the Texas Department of State Health Services. So this again also started in 2017. We worked to establish seven field sites along the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, we had a site, we had Progreso, Harlingen, McAllen, Rio Grande City, uh, we had Eagle Pass, Laredo, and Del Rio. And so what we would do is we would collect from these using those oviposition cups, those cups that were able to collect mosquito eggs, and we could then bring those eggs back to the lab. In 2019, we added two more sites, San Benito and Brownsville. So we all, all together, we have seven field sites that we're collecting. When we bring those eggs in, we then hatch those eggs. We identify what kind of species of mosquito they are and then we test the ones that we're interested in for insecticide resistance. The ones that we're interested in, again, are primarily those Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. That's what these oviposition cups are almost exclusively going to collect for the mosquito populations. We break down the collections into three month periods, uh, what we call them winter, spring, summer, fall, just so that that way we can do a seasonal comparison of what we see with resistance. So the way that we do these collections is we have uh, student and employee vol uh, student volunteers and employees going out. They set these oviposition cups in these different locations. They can be around houses and bushes and yards and so forth. 
They then get collected. Uh, this is a, a Ziploc bag with some of the eggs in them. They get brought back to the lab where we count how many eggs we have. And then we actually hatch those eggs. These are pans of mosquito larvae that were hatched in the lab so that we can then see what mosquitoes that we have. Again, we want to focus on the Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus mosquitoes. One thing that this enables us to do is that we can actually track the numbers of eggs over time so we can sort of see how those numbers are shifting, how the populations changed. So for example, San Benito, as I said, was added in 2019. This is a sort of a, a rough approximation of the eggs that we see. And again, if you remember, I mentioned that bimodal curve. So we sort of see a peak, it drops down a little bit, then starts to increase again in the fall season. The two years of collection from the Callan show the same kind of bimodal activity. This is from 2018. We see a bump in the numbers, then it drops down in the summer, increases again in the fall, winter, we don't see very many, many mosquitoes at all. In fact, we do stop collections in uh, late November or December and start them up again in January. As much as I want to, I can't convince my students to go out on Christmas to go collect mosquito eggs. So then we start up again in the, the next year, we saw again a, a, a bump in the or a spring season, drop in the summer, and then a slight increase again in the fall. This is about Harlingen and Progresso, uh, again from 2018-2019. It's interesting, these two cities are very close to each other. So the red and the blue lines, blue is Harlingen, red is Progresso. They mirror each other very closely. We, see, we didn't see as much of a, a seasonal bump in those springs months there, but we did in 2019. And, and then towards the end of 2019, that number started increasing again. In Del Rio and Laredo, these are the furthest west sites that we have. 2018 was actually very interesting for the almost the first uh, two thirds or three quarters of the year, we were getting incredibly low numbers of mosquitoes in, the, in that population. And this was also backed up by vector control in the area where they were saying they were not getting any mosquitoes in their traps. Then in the uh, fall, that number bumped up again. And it turns out if they had very low rainfall counts in early 2018. And they think we think this is why we had such few numbers of mosquitoes. 2019, we had a little bit more rain, so we saw that early bump, and then we're still in the process of counting eggs uh, for the fall season, but I anticipate that we'll see that bimodal peak again, like we see in the rest of the area. So once we hatch these eggs, we do want to identify the species, again, either Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus, so we can start to see like what species are most common in these different areas. It's very critical to identify this because the different species have different ability to transmit disease. Dengue is much more likely to be transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Same thing with Zika virus. Depending on the strain of chikungunya virus, some strains are more likely to be transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Some strains are more likely to be transmitted by Aedes albopictus. So we can start looking at the species composition as well as how it changes over time. And I'm going to show you a few examples of that. Here we have Progresso from fall 2017, spring 2018, summer 2018. And you can see that we have a pretty constant, anywhere from about 25% to one third, 33% or so of the population are Aedes albopictus. And about 75, two thirds to three quarters are Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. So that's what we are seeing year round. If we look at Rio Grande City, a little bit further west, a little bit drier than Harlingen, you see that we see in the fall 2017, spring 2018, we see a greater abundance of aegypti, less albopictus overall. And then actually in the summer, we didn't see any albopictus at all. This makes sense because Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti show differential ability to survive very dry, very hot climates. Uh, they both can lay their eggs and those eggs can uh, survive for long periods of time but Aedes aegypti is better suited to surviving and uh, having those eggs survive in very dry, hot weather than Aedes albopictus. So as we get to these climates in the summer where it is a little bit drier and hotter than we do have over here, it makes sense that we would see much lower abundance of Aedes albopictus. If we look at uh, the uh, mosquito species abundance, from a sort of from a geographic perspective from Brownsville, which is the easternmost site to Eagle Pass, which is one of the most westernmost sites. You can sort of see a little bit of this trend. In Brownsville, we're close to a, almost a 50-50 ratio of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. 
In San Benito, we do have a little bit more Egypti, Harlingen more. Progresso's a little bit closer to 50-50, but then by the time we get to Rio Grande City and then ultimately Eagle Pass, we see this increasing trend of 80s, 80s increased 80s Egypti, decreased 80s Albopictus numbers. This is from 2019. And so again, we want to back this up with multiple years of data. Anytime you do field, da field data, you do want to check to make sure that it's a consistent pattern you see over year to year. This little wedge right here, the 6% from San Benito is really interesting. Uh, this was a third species called Aquaritatis triceriatus or the Eastern tree hole mosquito. We've, we do have that one down here. Um, I've occasionally collected adults. We've never found any in any egg collections from any of the cities until we got these eggs from San Benito. So um, it does generally prefer a little bit more of a cooler uh, environment, a little bit more of a forested or a covered environment. And so that may be why we see it uh, in San Benito and not some of these other areas. Once we get the adults, we do then what's referred to as a CDC bottle assay to test for insecticide resistance. Uh, this assay is conducted, we take a Wheaton bottle and we coat the inside with the active ingredient of the insecticide we're interested in. We focus on three insecticides, delta methrin, permethrin, and sumethrin. Uh, permethrin is, almost, is the one that's almost used exclusively for vector control in the region, so that's a critical one to see if we get resistance or not. Uh, delta methrin and sumethrin are related insecticides. They're uh, synthetic pyrethroids, and so they all have similar modes of action. We then put a number of mosquitoes in, this, in these bottles. Uh, we aim for 30 mosquitoes. Every 15 minutes, we roll the bottle back and forth, and we count to see how many mosquitoes are still flying around. If they're flying around, they're considered uh, not yet killed by the insecticide. If they've been immobilized, they may still be walking but they almost look drunk. They're sort of wobbling around a little bit. They can't really fly at all. Those are ones that we consider killed by the insecticide. And so we look at them every 15 minutes for two hours. The data that I'm gonna present is data that's based on what's referred to as a diagnostic time. So the mortality rates that we see after 30 minutes, because most of these insecticides are supposed to kill mosquitoes after 30 minutes. If we wait the full two hours, we may see 100% mortality, but it's really after that 30 minutes that we can potentially identify concerns about insecticide resistance. So this is what some of those results may look like. And again, this is comparing 2018 and 2019. On the x-axis, we have three different, the three different insecticides, delta methrin, permethrin, and sumethrin. And we have on the y-axis, the mortality at 30 minutes. So how many of those mosquitoes died after 30 minutes? So you can see here that with the permethrin, again, this is the one that's used primarily in the lower Rio Grande Valley region. Uh, at 30 minutes, we had about a 45% mortality rate in 2018. The mosquitoes collected in 2019, we had about a 35% mortality rate. This is actually uh, pretty low. The CDC considers anything, any mortality rate less than 80% as an indicator of insecticide resistance. If you compare that to what we see with delta methrin and sumethrin, we actually have lower mortality rates for those two, which is particularly interesting because that would suggest there's some resistance to those, but those aren't being actively used. Those aren't being, those aren't the insecticides that the mosquitoes are being exposed to. So it's possible there may be some sort of cross, uh, cross sensitivity or cross resistance. If they start evolving resistance to permethrin, they're more resistant to those two. These are some questions we're trying to answer in the lab but certainly the permethrin one is still a concern for resistance. This is comparing some of the cities from 2018. Uh, so you see that we have our seven cities on the x-axis, on the uh, x -axis. again, the mortality on the y-axis. Overall, there's basically no difference between the different cities. Uh, we didn't see any significance in terms of the city response, any cities that had higher or lower mortality rates in 2018. If we compare that, uh, 2018, so this was uh, two, based on the individual insecticides and then compare that to the individual, the two different years. So here we have the mortality for delta methrin in blue, permethrin in red, sumethrin in green. 2018 is here on the top, 2019 is on the bottom. Remember, we didn't have San Benito and Brownsville in 2018. We do see it looks like an overall decrease in mortality rates. Permethrin still does seem to be the best insecticide overall. 
San Benito is interesting because they had the highest mortality rate overall. Uh, Brownsville, they showed a low or decreased mortality rate to permethrin. But again, we still see that delta methrin and sumethrin, the blue and the green bars, in many cases seem to be lower than the permethrin bar, the red bar. Uh, we have a few examples where that's not the case, but it does, it's just an uh, unexpected finding that insecticides that aren't being used seem to show uh, some levels of resistance. Now, I had mentioned earlier that one of the things we want to do is try to compare the different seasons. So here's, an here's a graph showing those, those uh, winter, spring, summer, fall seasonal time periods, 2018 to 2019. And what you can see here for these different insecticides, delta methrin, permethrin, or sumethrin, is it looks like in some cases the resistance changes season to season. So if we look only at the 2000 data to start, permethrin looked pretty comparable for each of those seasons. We didn't have any winter mosquitoes that we tested, but each of the three seasons that we tested. But sumethrin actually showed a significant increase in mortality. So almost as if it was a loss of resistance from the spring to summer to fall. If we look in the 2019 data, the winter mosquitoes uh, showed a higher uh, susceptibility to permethrin, but once we got to sp spring and summer, we're still in the process of doing the fall testing. Uh, spring and summer showed decreased mortality, and we saw the same thing with sumethrin. Uh, delta methrin, we didn't see much difference. So that brings up a lot of questions about this variability. One, uh, you might be thinking, oh, well, maybe they're evolving resistance, or maybe they're losing resistance on an evolutionary time scale. But this is a very short time scale to either lose resistance, like we see here with sumethrin in 2018, or gain resistance like we see with permethrin in 2019. Usually we talk about resistance being evolved or lost over at least uh, eight to 10 generations. Uh, that's what laboratory studies have estimated. In reality, with the mosquito growth rates and populations that we see, we probably have not been able to have more than four or five generations occur in the field. So if, if, if that's the explanation, then either the laboratory data suggesting how quickly resistance can be gained or lost seems to be incorrect, or there might be some other explanation. It could be that we're just sampling from different populations, even though we're collecting from those different areas, it is a random sampling. So maybe some of this variation variability is due to random change. This is why it's critical to continue this process over a multi-year period so we can see if the variation changes. And I'm particularly interested, for example, to see if sumethrin in 2019 shows the same increase here or not, or if we see the same, or if it seems to remain the same. Because that potentially will tell us a little bit if the variability is due to randomness or if there are actually changes in the mosquito population. If this is a pattern that we see consistently, that would suggest that it's actually changes in the population themselves. So that brings me to the end of my talk. I'm happy to go and answer any questions that people may have. Um, please feel free to speak up. If people are uncomfortable, they can always email me later as well. Thank you, Chris. I'm not sure how you do a round of applause via Zoom, but I'll <laughs> applaud for you. Uh, we'll assume everyone's applauding, all 50 people. Um, so I typed in the chat for everyone. I see some applause coming up. I typed in the chat for everyone to post their questions there or unmute themselves and ask if it's not too chaotic. I'm going to get us started with a question. Sure. So um, my first question was, these diseases where there's really, really low transmission, like chikungunya, one out of a few uh, years that you um, surveilled, what do we assume is happening there? Is there just one infected person with an active case that, that transmits it every few years? Someone comes in with an active case every few years? Like, what, what is there a reservoir? So that's a very difficult question to answer, and I unfortunately don't have a nice answer for that. Um, that's the way science works a lot of time. Nice answers aren't always available. There's a, there are potentially a lot of different explanations. It could be that the disease is out there and we're just not finding it. Um, that's not necessarily a comforting answer to, to hear about, but uh, some many of these diseases, there's a certain percentage of the population that's gonna be asymptomatic. And so someone may be infected with the disease but not go, but ne never show any symptoms, or maybe it's just sort of a, a bio, it seems like a mild cold or something like that, so they don't really do anything about it. Um, with mosquito testing itself, 
uh, in the prevalence of positive mosquitoes during an outbreak is usually about one, uh, a high prevalence of infection in a mosquito outbreak for mosquito-borne disease is about one out of a thousand mosquitoes in, is infected. And this is why it's so critical to be collecting and testing huge numbers of mosquitoes. Because even if we're in the middle of a dengue outbreak or a chikungunya outbreak, we're still gonna end up getting a 0.1% or even less infection rate in the mosquitoes that are being tested. So the, the fact that we have negatives is not a surprising thing to me, the, given that we haven't had the, the case counts. Um, if we, in fact, if we started getting positives, that would be a very, very concerning thing because uh, a scenario because all of a sudden we're getting positives, but where are the human cases? Um, my guess is that there is some degree of circulation in the, in the human populations that's not just identified. There may also be instances where uh, people are uh, get the disease somewhere else. Again, don't not knowing they're sick, they come here and then get bitten by a mosquito here, resulting in some uh, uh, transmission. Uh, but if, if I had to place odds, I'd place that we do have some circulation of the disease. It's really just a question of identifying it and correctly diagnosing it. And that's a lot, a lot of times uh, medical practitioners also aren't trained to diagnose some of these diseases. People come in and they complain of some of these symptoms. A lot of times they're described as generic flu-like symptoms because they sound like the flu. And so people come in, they're diagnosed as a flu, they get better after a few days and they think nothing more of it. Okay, we have a couple of audience questions. So one is <laughs> why are mosquitoes attracted to carbon dioxide? because they're smart. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, that's just the, what they use to identify that there's an animal nearby. If you think about it, uh, vertebrate hosts that, where, that have blood that the mosquitoes are looking for, what's the one thing that all vertebrates are gonna do every time they exhale? They're, they are breathing out carbon dioxide. And so they've evolved this ability because basically carbon dioxide is a big red flag saying, I'm over here, come and bite me. Okay. And so that's why we use carbon dioxide in the traps because it tricks them into thinking there's a host there. If you can hold your breath for a few days, then I can pretty much guarantee you probably won't be bitten by too many mosquitoes. <laughs> okay, how about this one? How are mosquitoes who survive your insecticide study discarded or killed? Um, so we we do kill any mosquitoes. We're not going to release. We're not, we're not trying to breed a super population of resistant mosquitoes or anything. So we do uh, kill them after the study. Uh, usually, just put them in a freezer or something like that and kill them. Uh, last year, we started sending some of the mosquitoes, both ones that had been killed and ones that hadn't been killed, to a couple different labs for genetic studies because they've identified some of the genes that are involved in insecticide resistance in mosquitoes. It's called KDR mutation, knockdown resistance, because that's what the, the behavior that's observed, they get knocked down. And so uh, we're hoping to get some data back about uh, the prevalence of that gene in some of these populations, which might be able to answer some questions about are, is the prevalence of the gene changing or what else might be going on. Okay. We have another question from the Zoom audience. So they state that last summer they were very sick and after a few weeks, the doctor diagnosed them with typhus and mm -hmm. the doctor said it was from a mosquito bite. And no. they asked, do only fleas pass typhus or can mosquitoes pass it too? Yes, so uh, flea, uh, if you think back to the very beginning when I talked about like the, some of those barriers and stuff, the reason why certain uh, animals can't, or certain vectors can't transmit all diseases is because in many cases, the disease has to uh, infect those animal cells. And as we know from pathogens, a lot of diseases are host specific. And in fact, that's one thing that's very interesting about vector-borne diseases. They've evolved to become less host specific. They can infect multiple kinds of animals. But uh, mosquitoes cannot transmit typhus. It, it, it is a flea bite. Um, and this, uh, I don't want to, uh, Put your doctor on the spot or anything, but this is one of the one of things I just mentioned. A lot of times, medical practitioners aren't really trained well in uh, vector-borne diseases. Oh, you're you're muted, Catherine. I can't. You're still muted. Do other audience members have final questions? Okay, well, 
let me uh, just mention one last thing that I, I wanted to ask Chris. So you were wondering about the up and down in um, resistance. Mm -hmm. And you, you, the first thing that occurred to me was the, what you mentioned about population sample, that you're mm -hmm. not getting the complete population. I also wondered about the likelihood of gene flow from, from other regions. So that, that's a possibility. Um, a lot of these mosquitoes, especially Aedes aegypti, and all these graphs, I've, I forgot to mention this, all these graphs were Aedes aegypti because those those were the majority of the uh, mosquitoes that we were collecting. Aedes aegypti actually has a very short flight with, uh, range. Um, in fact, they might fly at most uh, a football yard, 100 yards or so during their lifetime. So within a, a neighborhood, you might have some movement of the mosquitoes but probably even within neighborhoods that are half a mile or a mile apart, you're gonna, you're, you're, it's thought that you're gonna have very little movement between populations there and certainly between cities. Uh, we've, we're act, we've actually started some trying to look into a little bit of that, doing some genetic uh, work with Dr. Schinzel to try to uh, look at uh, sort of haplotyping of the mitochondrial DNA to see how much movement we can actually identify taking place. But certainly from a historical perspective, uh, it suggests that there, there should be, from what we understand, not, not, not a significant amount of gene flow. Okay, final question. What are precautions people can do at home to protect from mosquitoes? Um, the biggest things are uh, wear long sleeve clothing, use DEET. Um, I'm not gonna go and uh, advertise for one specific DEET-based product, but there's a number out there that can be bought in just about any store, uh, Home Depot, things like that. Those are effective, those work. Um, if you apply that before you go outside, that's one of the best ways to go. Different mosquitoes have different periods of activity. So for example, Aedes aegypti is commonly thought to be what's referred to as a day biter. And so if you go out in the evenings, you might avoid that. Uh, on the other hand, Culex quincapaciatus, the one that transmits West Nile virus, is thought to be a crepuscular feeder, feeding in dawn and dusk periods, so you're less likely to see that if you're out in the middle of the day. But the big thing is, is wear DEET, long sleeve clothing, uh, light colored clothing. Actually, they have eyes they can see. They actually have been shown to be more attracted to dark clothing. So if you wear light colored clothes and that kind of thing. Okay, a real quick. Does UTRGV have offerings for graduate programs in epidemiology? Do so we don't have offerings for graduate programs in epidemiology. Um, I, I'll do a plug for my disease epi course at the undergraduate level. Um, certainly I have students in my lab that want to pursue that uh, and get their master's here and then maybe go get a PhD in epidemiology. Um, and so I've, I've had some students in my lab pursue that route. Um, we, we also partner with a MPH program, the master's in public health. Um, I can, I forget who's in contact with that, but I can always try and give some information to people if they're interested. Uh, but sir, I, I think public health is one of those areas that a lot of people who are interested in maybe health and, and public welfare and medicine don't necessarily think of as a, as a direction to go right away. Uh, but it is an area that is available for people who want to sort of pursue the health side of biology and, and still, and maybe not be a doctor or something like that. Okay. Well, thank you, Chris. We appreciate your time and uh, giving the seminar today. So thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. If anyone thank else you. has any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, anyone who knows me, I knows. I, I mean, don't come to school now or anything like that. But in the future, please feel free to come by my office. Uh, and and if, if you want to chat about things or anything like that. All right. Bye, all.